Hello and welcome to the critical move of Telesur. Two years Ivan Duque served as president of Colombia. Two years of management where criticism, not only from the parliamentary opposition, but also and above all from the victims of the armed conflict, has been on the decline in a context that shows, moreover, a country immersed in an unprecedented health crisis. Why does Colombia show the current socio-political panorama? What does Duque focus his agenda on, both domestically and internationally? What geopolitical impact has his visit to Nariño had? Let's deploy the board. It starts the first move. On August 7, 2018, Ivan Duque was sworn in as president of Colombia, according to experts and defenders of human rights. During this period, the increase in violence in the territories and the failure to comply with the peace agreements. On the subject of the date, let's listen to the president's words and other reactions. Because the pandemic will not take away from us the desire to have a Colombia with more legality, with more entrepreneurship, and with more equity. We have overcome it with measures based on science and with responsibility. We have done it with clear measures to protect life and health, but at the same time to protect the life of the micro, small, and medium enterprises and the life of employment. Duque decided to follow the deadly path of Trump and Bolsonaro. He decided to throw people into the streets to guarantee profit for others and death in the houses. You said in the end that you were going to respect peace and you are not respecting it. So we are in the hands of a person who says one thing in campaign and does something else when he is in government. We cannot upset that. And we are also in the hands of a person who does not respect the sovereignty that is becoming less and less. We are subordinated to the agenda of the United States. That is why there are fumigations. That is why foreign troops are arriving. That is why there is an aggression against a neighboring country. I would like to summarize these two years of Ivan Duque as a leader, as president of the Republic, as an absolute absence of a country agenda. What Mr. Duque has not offered is a party agenda, not a country agenda. His two fundamental pillars, his two fundamental flags have been nothing more and nothing less than the destruction of peace with withering of peace. And on the other hand, today it is presented to us as the withering, the destruction, and the attack of justice, the institutionality of the separation and divisions of powers. It is a government that had dedicated itself for two years to defending Alvaro Uribe Vélez by attacking justice, so it has not governed because it has dedicated two years to attacking. So they are going to reform the GAP, they are going to reform the justice system, they are going to reform the peace process, and in that way, give it two years in Congress without approving practically anything. Planyene, a drug trafficker, financed the campaign, appeared Memo Fantasma, who is nothing less than a drug trafficker, being a partner of the Vice President of Colombia in a building on 85th Street in Bogota. Appeared the cocaine laboratory in the farm of an ambassador, appeared a pilot, and it appears multiple photos like the boy Hernandez with the president and with Alvaro Uribe, whose plane fell in Guatemala with cocaine and he died. 20 million of his belongings are reported to the campaign as income from donations. Closely linked to the management of President Ivan Duque, his former president and senator Álvaro Uribe Vélez, who is currently undergoing a judicial process. Let's see why. The investigative chamber of the Colombia Supreme Court of Justice unanimously ruled the sentence that establishes the house arrest of former President Uribe, accused of witness tampering and procedural fraud.
The judicial instance was created in January 2018 and began to operate in September of the same year, when the criminal cessation chamber charged Yuri Bebelas for allegedly being involved with a series of criminal acts. The investigations have allegedly demonstrated irregular practices directed by a senator to manipulate judicial processes of street justice, among other crimes in which his personal lawyers, Diego Cadena and Juan Jose Salazar, both of whom were prosecuted and sentenced, are also involved pending a formal sentence. Although on this occasion the leader of the Democratic Center Party is charged with only two legal acts, illegal acts, there are more than 270 trials that Uribe is facing for serious crimes. One of the biggest cases he's investigated for is the killing of the towns of El Aro, La Granja, and San Roque, as well as the murder of a lawyer. These acts were attributed to the parliamentary group, parliamentary group Auto Defensas Unidas de Colombia, settled in Antioquia, when the current senator was the governor of the mentioned department. In 2008, several ex paramilitaries pointed to Uribe Vélez as intellectual author of the crimes. It was even Salvatore Mancuso himself, a former paramilitary commander, who testified that when the governor had knowledge of the massacre. Albert Uribe is also accused of trying to manipulate the statements of former paramilitaries in prison through payments to buy their silence or modify their statements. This case is the only investigation for which a former president has been called to investigate in Colombia. In addition, during the current year, the Colombian justice system opened a new investigation after several journalistic complaints that point to Uribe injecting illicit money into the electoral campaign of the current president, Ivan Duque, also a member of the Democratic Center Party and considered one of Uribe's political godchildren. Recordings link the late drug trafficker Jose Guillermo Nene Hernandez to army and police journalists, as well as to several well-known officials and politicians, including Duque and Uribe. With this decision of the Supreme Court of Justice in Colombia, not only is the senator deprived of his liberty, but he is also forced to leave his seat according to Article 359 of Law 600. I invite you to check some digital information about this context. Uh, for instance, let's see what the Nueva Prensa says. Ivan Lucas and Alvaro Uribe's trusted campaign pilot disappeared in Guatemala carrying cocaine from the Sinaloa cartel. Samuel David Nino Cataño, Ivan Duque's election campaign pilot and trusted advisor to Alvaro Uribe Vélez, rushed ashore and disappeared on Tuesday, December 3, on the border between Guatemala and Mexico, transporting a shipment of cocaine for the Sinaloa cartel from Colombia. Nino Cataño was a native of Villavillencio and the brother of Hernán Gómez Nino, a leader of the Janeiro Party of the Democratic Center and former candidate for governor of Meta. Pilot Samuel David Nino Cataño was a special guest at the presidential inauguration of Ivan Duque on August 7, 2018. He shared the stage with the late drug trafficker José Guillermo Hernández Aponte, alias El Ñeñe, political boss of Marcos de Jesús Figueroa's criminal gang, alias Marquitos. Nene vote votes for Duque in the latest for at least four departments, La Guajira, Cesar, Magdalena, and Santander. The first news of the accident in which Nino Catania was not mentioned was broadcast on December 4, 2018 by the Guatemalan Army through its Twitter account. The plane did not report its presence in Guatemalan skies to local aviation authorities but was detected by radar. Several brands of the twin-inch plane indicate that it would be made in the United States, according to the Guatemalan Defense Ministry. Petén is a department of Guatemala, located in the far north of that country and bordering the Mexican states of Quintana Roo and Campeche. It is a crucial point for the transfer of Colombian cocaine to the United States. The road through Petén belongs to the Sinaloa cartel, which today is run by two sons of Chapo Guzmán, known as Los Chapitos. Political sources in Meta, who prefer not to be identified, told La Nueva Prensa that the pilot disappeared at the end of last year on a black flight carrying narcotics through Central America. And one issue which is relatively recent and which I don't want to leave out because it has indigenousness with neighboring Venezuela regarding Colombia is what our news house Telesur has published last July 27th. Venezuela denounces looting and vandalism of its consulate in Bogotá. 
The government of Venezuela denounced to the international community the looting and vandalization of its consulate in Bogota, Colombia. The Colombian government is in flagrant violation of Articles 22 and 25 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations by allowing, by action or omission, the illegal occupation of our consular headquarters in Bogota the South American country's foreign ministry said in a statement. It maintained that the government of President Nicolás Maduro holds the government of Colombia responsible for the loss of violation of property, archives and documents in accordance with the provisions of Article 24 of the Vienna Convention. He recalled that, according to Article 45 of the aforementioned Convention, in the event of the rupture of diplomatic relations between two states, or if a mission is definitely or temporarily terminated, the receiving state shall be obli obliged to respect and protect, even in the event of armed conflict, the premises of the mission as well as its property and archive. The statement from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs ended by assuring that the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela reserves the right to carry out reciprocal diplomatic actions to, com to compensate for his unacceptable aggression against the premises of the Venezuela missions in the Republic of Colombia. I repeat, it's a subject that I want to talk about later with my guest. But coming back to a subject that we had already opened, I'd like to suggest to you the reading of an article titled Matador Stuff's Dispatch Against Duque's Two Years, published on the magazine's website Semana, last August 6. According to cartoonist Julio Cesar Gonzalez, better known as Matador, President Ivan Duque is a puppet of Uribe, and the country knows it. In fact, he said his actions are so bad that not even armoring himself with a prosecutor and comproller, he said, prevented his mentor from being protected by the Supreme Court of Justice. In Matador's view, President Ivan Duque looks like J. Mario Valencia, may he rest in peace, a television set presenter. He also said that it is ridiculous to think that Duque is practicing when all he does is follow the guidelines ordered by former President Álvaro Uribe, sign decrees, and go out every day to make a broadcast. In his opinion, once the pandemic is over, there will be a social explosion because of the president's lack of action. Matador West further and questioned statements such as those made by Juan Carlos Pinzon, a former defense minister, that President Ivan Duque is a good person. In his opinion, what is at stake is not whether or not the president is a good person, but rather his capacity for governance. In Gonzalez's opinion, it is clear that nobody knew Ivan Duque, and he is there because former President Álvaro Uribe put him there. If the debate lies in the president's personality, Julio Cesar Gonzalez wonders why he, not, why he got into the first state legislature? In Matador's opinion, Duque's administration is so bad that it was during his presidency that Uribe ended up being arrested, even in one Juan Manuel Santos' administration. His government began by talking about an orange economy that Colombians were trying to understand, and now the subject has turned completely to the coronavirus that afflicts the world. Let's update more information with our correspondent Hernán Tobar from Bogotá, Colombia. Thank you. Last August 7, it was two years in the presidential chair of Ivan Duque Márquez, with many questions. First from the social sectors, the former combatants, the peace activists. They are questioning him because the peace agreements have not been fully complied with. The whole issue of integral reform, the economic resources for this play, for these peace plans because they have not been fulfilled. And the number of assassinations of former combatants this year has risen to 36. In this year, social and human rights organizations assured that more than 170 have been murdered. Quite a few questions regarding the resources that had been allocated for death. Health. These have not reached the hospitals and clinics. Doctors continue to protest outside the hospitals because they have not received their biosecurity equipment. Many members of the medical sectors have denounced that they have been without their salaries for more than a year, lacking ventilators, and that has made the contention curve increase in Colombia. 
Also, other issues that have to do with the evidence that has been known through the media, possible links with drug traffickers, some describe it as a legitimate government. All this revolves around the two years that the President Duque has been in power. Thank you very much, Hernan. Let's take our first break in our critical move. Remember, there is always a strategic move in social media for you to participate with us. On the second anniversary of Ivan Duque's term as President of Colombia, we ask ourselves, have the increase in systematic violence and the failure to implement the peace agreements been accidental, or are they part of a hidden agenda? Leave your opinion. Let's take a short break. We'll be back soon. Let's make a summary of these two years of President Ivan Duque's administration. This is what we are talking about today in our critical move. Let's see. Ivan Duque took office as President of Colombia on August 7, 2018. His speech was focused on national reconciliation. However, today as the country faces COVID-19 and shows a weak public health system, the nation faces other pandemics such as the upsurge in violence after the signing of peace agreement. Two years after taking office, the barriers to implementing these agreements are evident. The agrarian question, political reform, the dismantling of parliamentarism, the substitution of illicit crops, to name but a few of the things that could have helped rebuild hope for the suffering Colombia people remain without progress. President Duque promised, as part of his agenda, to fight inequality and extreme poverty, but in the last two years his government has been characterized by greater inequality and the systematic killings of social leaders to former combatants of the FARC EP. In 2018, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, CEPAL, reported a wide inequality gap between rural and urban areas. The first one is at 43.4% and the second one at 26%. The number of massacres last year was 36 cases and 133 deaths, the highest since 2014, when five clashes killed 51 people, according to the United Nations Office for Human Rights. In terms of systematic killings, at least 573 social leaders and defenders of human rights are reported in several regions of the country during the Duque's administration, according to data from the Independent Development Institute for Peace. A harshly criticized action by citizens and opposition sectors was the arrival in the country of a security force assistance brigade to help Colombia in its fight against narcotics. According to the explanation offered by the government, the U.S. Embassy in Bogota noted that it is a specialized army unit formed to advise and assist in operations in allied nations. But what is alarming is that the consolidated action last June was carried out by hand without prior consultation with current Congress. Duque's second year as head of state also comes in the midst of the Supreme Court's decision to issue house arrest against former President and Senator Álvaro Uribez Vélez considered a mentor of the current president for a procedural fraud and witness tampering. Here's one issue that it is not minor. It is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Ivan Duque's Colombia. Let's review. 
The health crisis generated by the COVID-19 pandemic is worsening in Colombia. The country has just recorded the newest outbreak of the virus in Latin America, ranking eighth in the world, with a rate of infection that already reaches 10,000 cases per day, making a total of 387,481 positive cases. Deaths, which already exceeded 12,000, continue to grow quickly, reaching 300 daily. With respect to the areas most affected by the outbreak of the novel coronavirus, Bogota remains the epicenter, with 129,175 cases. It is followed by the departments of Atlantico and Tokyo and Valle del Cauca, with 57,525, 48,342, and 30,858, respectively. In addition to the alarming figures of the pandemic, the unemployment rate has increased, with an employment of 21.4% last May, equivalent to 0.47 million citizens. In this way, the country becomes the one with the most unemployment on the 37th and make of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. This is due to the fact that the Ivan Duque's government did not take measures to provide protection to the workers during the health crisis. A recent survey by Ivan Mer revealed that corruption and irregularities committed by officials when purchasing medical supplies or food have caused great public outrage. In parallel, many health professionals have resigned because they do not have personal protection elements to care for patients with coronavirus. In addition to their poor working conditions, others continue to protest because they have months without being paid. In most hospitals and health institutes, medical personnel are hired by third parties and entities that have no direct relationship with the hospitals, which is why they are left in debt. Analysts consider that with the, with the 43 exceptions authorized since the end of April and the opening of economic sectors such as manufacturing and non-essential services, the quarantine is no longer an effective measure in Colombia, and the figure seems to prove them right. The relaxation figures largely explain that growth of infections in places where the pandemic had been brought under control. In view of the critical situation, Duque ordered the, an extension of the mandatory quarantine enforced from March 25 to August 39. However, it continues to open up economic activity. In this context, pilot planes have already been initiated for national flights in municipalities considered by the executive to have low or no coronavirus infection, and international flights are expected to reopen on September 1st. We start the analysis in a critical move. We have both from Colombia. Dr. Maria Consuelo Mada, professor at the University Externado of Colombia, and Fernando Garcia Naranjo, political and media analyst. Welcome both of you to our critical move. Dr. Consuelo, according to this preamble, what is the country's agenda for Ivan Duque? Hello, Ray. Thank you for the invitation. Really, there are a lot of things that treated this subject. Everything has been very serious, according to neoliberal politics. And we see the extreme where we, uh, corruption has reached, and also the pandemic. And big banks become so poverty, despite by social sectors. Five million of new unemployment plus all others that has increased, and millions of people who are who has not an income at all. But the most uh, serious, more has been the issue of peace, which started more than two years ago when Duque won the elections, or Uribe through Duque. It was a serious concerning because uh, former government sh shared a neoliberal agenda. In accordance with former FARC, and in general, it was a good agreement, but this government has dedicated to sabotage it. Let's say that the Central Democratic said that, let's go to destroy it. But it has been destroying it, this agreement, and generate conditions so hard, deaths of social leaders. 
is one of the most highlighted situations. Uh, former combatants in areas where are more military control and it happens very frequently areas uh, especially in a border with Venezuela zones uh, such as El Caucano of the Pacific those are areas where they have assassinated social leaders with the indifference in, in a way of saying by the army but also there's the speech against peace against social leaders let's say that given given that's ran into the United States that goes against the point number four of the agreement so most of the leaders are the ones who work in the area of agriculture so this program this program uh, uh, the budget has, hasn't been applied. Everything has been a disaster. Well, we have seen such, so, just a little, very little. The only thing they're doing is to show how these former combatants are being reintegrated in some projects, just a few. But not too long ago, uh, with the pandemic, more than 100 ex former combatants appeared uh, facing the lack of support from the state. Let's say the situation is very critical. And in the face of this critical situation, doctor, before asking Federico, I want to ask you, in the face of this situation that you describe as critical, is there any hope even during the Duke uh, administration that a peace agreement will be restored? Well, according to the defenders, they have to. It's important to try to to stop to stop it from being destroyed as much as possible, and work uh, in favor of peace, and also to go back to social mobilization. Last year, November, uh, March, a very important point in the social communication with Chile, the defense of peace, it's a key point, the defense of life, the defense of leaders, the defense of former combatants. So what we truly need is to go back, because right now we're going to such a hard situation with the pandemic, and this is absolutely true. So create conditions where we can go back to mobilize, to take over the political control, and of course to work. Because in other years we have a government that's a coalition that gives back the democratic control over the people. But the pre bad reputation of Uribe. Well, I'd like to go into that aspect with you, if I may, uh, in a few minutes. But now, uh, allow me to introduce Federico to the dialogue. Uh, Federico, doctor was referring to the pandemic issue, and the President Duque has stated that they have overcome this pandemic with measures, and I quote his own words, based upon science, but the reality says otherwise. The country is now ranked number eight in the world by the number of positive cases and number one by the number of deaths per million inhabitants. How do you see it? Did science fail? On which science the Colombian executive based to face this pandemic? Does Federico listen to me? It doesn't look like he, he is. Uh, let's go then with Dr. Omada. Dr. Uh, you can refer to this subject yourself because in one way or another you have been touching one of these points in your analysis. So the subject here is that the problem is that President has tried to solve everything with a program that I, I really don't know who is referring to. But this has really no principle of truth. Uh, it is registering such bad records when it comes to the pandemic figures and when it comes to to the figures which is uh, everybody knows is a key point to be able to to fight the pandemic at a colon at 
an economical level has been a disaster. We know that these people don't have. It's been so reduced. A lot of people, and if compared with other neoliberal countries such as Chile and Peru, it's very clear that less than 3% in the pandemic, everything he has given to big banks and to big businessmen, those ones who finance his campaign. But this is a very serious situation. And it's, it is very concerning. It is very concerning. Let's say that over more than four months in a quarantine, and it has been very difficult and people need to go out, people need to go out to work and go back to the economical activities. Thank you, doctor. Doctor, stay with us. Um, Federico, if you hear me this time, welcome to a critical move. Why does this situation of the pandemic constitute a policy for the Colombian state in theory, but it is not observed in practice? Why? Thank you for the invitation. Yes, uh, the government, as well as with all of its policies, has have a very permanent attitude of having a speech with good intentions, a speech where it compromises, for instance, to fulfill the uh, peace agreements and carry out measures to protect public health. But what we have seen is that in practical, every, it's so far away from the speech. And when we see the practice, he only has to support big businessmen, the big banks, and in function of guarantee not only the life of people, but also the possibility of carrying out extreme quarantines with aggressive social situation. Just as the professor was just describing, there are a lot of people, majority of colonial workers, that can just stay home. They need to go out to work because they need to provide for their families. So these social measures to guarantee the presence of people in their homes, plus the law investment, and almost all of it destined to favor big capital, because it is the big issue in this situation with one of the highest death rates in the world for 100,000 inhabitants and with an overflowing health situation. Thank you, Federico. Doctor, a subject uh, we had put on hold, the judicial process against former President and Senator Álvaro Uribe. What does this unprecedented event in Colombia's most recent political history tell us? Well, we have said it before, we have pointed it out, and everything that um, represents around his alliances with mafia, with paramilitarism, with his family, his brother, his cousins. But it is important to highlight uh, the vision that the Supreme Court of Justice has taken. There are evidences. So those people that are questioning president and are so nothing, none of that is true of those people who are demanding that. And through interviews with uh, interviews with his uh, lawyers and people who tried to buy them, the same ones who 12 years ago, and in this situation again, it's happening again, back in the uh, times, and when we see this, not only to their families, but we see that they're still denouncing upon social and unions principles, and this is happening. They have to create a link with the army, with judicial societies. There is a huge weight of knowing what's going on in the country. Let's say we're moving on clearly to a completely authoritarian state and completely fascist. As I said before, first they support it, then they eliminate them. And the power of the sector of the Colombian society, because the government needs to take back the control, and the, the so-called democratic security. So in front of this, we can say that the government 
It's about to set a neoliberal government. At least it has set a ray of hope when it comes to the topic of peace. And they need to fight with him to get to. But with Duque, there's nothing like that. There is also the one other thing that is true. So everything faces a very hard situation for the country. And as I said, hope is based upon the bad reputation he has shown. And that many sectors are realizing that now there's going to be an election of where he has set up his moves. So what we want to see is from the point of view of the dictatorial control and fascist control that and taking into account what doctor has just been said, that dictatorial and fascist control, what guarantees are there that the judicial process applied to Senator Alvaro Uribe will be successful? Well, it is true that the Colombian regime has been characterized through history by being an authoritarian and being a regime that avoids the critical thinking, has persecuted it through history. But also it's true that the Colombian political regime has been a huge stability by institutions. Well, is the Colombian system, judicial system is very inefficient. And it has proved so sort of independence when it comes to other public powers. For, as, for, for instance, it denied the possibility of a second re-election from Uribe. And another part of what has been known as the parapolitic phenomenon, um, paramilitary with political life of the country, but that also has been on judicial branch. And in this case, as well as Professor Consola said, we are facing a judicial case with decisions that have been made under the law. It doesn't have anything to do with political security, but with possible behave, intellectual behave of manipulating witnesses. So it is possible that this process moves on, but of course, despite of being a very judicial case, it has some political issues. Undoubtedly, we have seen we have seen the debate between different uh, political currents, and it has developed an argument in campaign directed to give a bad reputation to the Supreme Court of Justice. So it is very possible that before these evidences against Uribe and against its environment in this case, it is very possible that there is a sentence, but the political effects will, will, will be about to see because two years in front of these elections, we see a government that, as described, is very weak. President doesn't show an important character of calling out the citizens, but on the other ways. So these are conditions that are there to make us think and to take an optimism point of view. And it's, it's possible to see a political change in Colombia. And I think that will be very interesting in development in the future. Thank you so much, Federico. And I also thank Dr. Maria Consuelo for your time for our critical move today. Let's take another break in our critical move. But remember, there is a strategic move in social media for you to participate. On the second anniversary of Ivan Duque's term as president of Colombia, we ask ourselves, have the increase in systematic violence and the failure to implement the peace agreements been accidental, or are they part of a hidden agenda? Stay with us. We'll be back soon. How does Colombia fit into the geopolitical board of the region? We tell you about it. Successive Colombian governments, especially in the last two decades, have functioned as strategic allies of the U.S. interests in Latin America. 
Several mechanisms have been implemented to establish what both countries catalog as close cooperation. Such is the case of Plan Colombia, which has allowed the United States to root its political, economic and military interventionism in the region. Since it was signed in 1999 under the administrations of Andres Pastrana and Bill Clinton, this bilateral agreement turned out to be a screen to cover the implementation of U.S. armed forces in the South American nation. This military instrument mutated until it consolidated with the entry of Colombia into NATO in 2018 as the first Latin American global partner. According to the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, Colombia closed 2019 with 212,000 hectares of coca leaf, a slight increase from 208,000 hectares in the previous year. In addition, the country increased its capacity to produce cocaine to 950 one tons from 879 tons in 2018. In this context arises the announcement by the U.S. Embassy in Bogota in June of this year about the arrival of a contingent of about 800 Security Force Assistance Officers to allegedly advise and support the actions of the Colombian Army in the fight against drug trafficking, raised the strongest criticism of President Ivan Duque. In addition, the White House has used this nation as a theater of operations against the Bolivarian Venezuela. With the arrival of Ivan Duque to Casa de Nariño, there has been an increasing hostility towards the presidential authorities of Caracas and its people through the promotion of military intervention under the euphemism of diplomatic siege and the financing of foreign militaries to carry out violent actions on the other side of the border. The most recent, the failed Operation Gideon, whose executors, U.S. mercenaries captured and persecuted by justice, confessed to having trained in Colombia, from where they set sail to disembark in early made on the Venezuelan coast. This is a subject on which I will reflect in moments with Senator Ivan Cepeda, human rights defender, philosopher, mediator of the process of dialogue between the FARC-EP and the national government. Senator, welcome to our critical move. I don't want to miss the opportunity uh, to have this contact with you to reflect on another aspect that I had already been discussing with my previous guest. Just when it marked two years of Ivan Duque's administration, this decision was taken to place Senator Álvaro Uribe Vélez under house arrest, prosecuted by the Colombian justice. How did you receive this news? What does this add symbolizing the desire to achieve peace with social justice and Reparation for victims of the Colombian conflict? Well, first of all, greetings. Of course, this is something of a very huge importance that happened after a very long process, eight years late after a legal dispute that Senator and former President Uribe started, which has had a very important way out because Uribe has presented in front of the Supreme Court a very important amount of false witnesses to try to get to obtain a decision to be contained against and after a defense work very hard work it was able to reveal the reality in this case and he is the one who truly has to answer he is and with this decision that was taken on August 4th to deprive him from liberty by having him under house arresting is something that we are uh, facing or what can be a, a already a decision in, in the coming days of this Supreme Court of Justice. Senator, uh, following up on the analysis we've been doing on the Duque's administration, as never before has there been a presence of U.S. personnel in Colombia. For example, the much questioned arrival of the U.S. military to supposedly fight drug trafficking and provide advice to the Colombian army, simply accept it and and that's it, move on? Is there anything to do? No, we have been uh, very firmly opposing to this foreign presence in Colombia. We have to bring it into context. It is a develop of a complete whole plan 
uh, that have been traced by the Trump's administration for the region. And it has to do with the fact that in front of the politics of United States or the government of the United States towards Colombia, there is a sector of the Republican Party which has a very important influence in Florida, in Florida State. And acting by those circumstances, Trump has had the direction of the policy, this atmospheric, and completely to the politics directed to the Caribbean and Latin America. So that politics consists, such as you have said in your presentations, it's about maintaining a state of dependence when it comes to the directions in the continent, and most importantly, to attack the government who has a political side with different from the ones that the American, the US government has today. We've seen it against Cuba, against Nicaragua, against Venezuela. And for this, uh, they have tried to use Colombia as a political platform to carry out those aggressions. The one, the arrival of this military contingent has been part of it. And right now, those troops, or this troop, it is in a, an, an, an activity while the state council decided an action that we have presented, 25 congressmen to stop or to, to stop so that foreign presence may be um, discussed rightly. I don't want to miss this opportunity either to ask you, Senator, uh, given the continuous dis disruptions that the Duque administration has been going through in these two years of government, how is the political opposition preparing to achieve shows within two years' time the, re the reversal of the situation at the polls? What is this tragedy? Well, it's the creation of a pact which would have called a historical pact to generate a confluence, a convergence of political forces, of social movements that allows not only a victory, an electoral presidential victory um, for the elections of the Congress, but also a government model that allows us to realize changes, the changes we want to make in Colombia as in a strategic way. So effectively, there is a, uh, it, we are working very hard to be able to achieve and to get that agreement, that pact and as a consequence of a political convergence strong enough to be able to reach elections on 2022. Senator Ivan Cepeda, as always, it is a pleasure to dialogue with you, to reflect with you. Our critical move is so honored to have you. A big hug for you. See you soon. And as always, thank you very much to all of you in Telesur. Let's go to conclusions. An increase of violence in rural areas marked by the systematic murder of social leaders, human rights defenders, and demobilized far EP, as a direct result of throwing the peace agreement into the charge. A growing health crisis that ranks the country first in the world in terms of new deaths per million people and the consequent increase in employment and poverty, increased presence of paramilitary groups acting at will, especially in border areas, an increasingly muddy image of the role in Democratic Center Party, whose architect and mentor, Alvaro Uribez Vélez, is on trial, and an ever-increasing submission to the dictates of the White House, these are the extras that Duque's administration has had in these two years at the head of the Colombian executive. Will this be part of the headaches he admits as president in these two years, or simply it's all part of his plan? The plan of the extreme Colombian right? We'll keep an eye on it. For today, we close the geopolitical board.